Yeah, good morning, everybody. As you see, uh, today I would like to switch to the uh, PowerPoint presentation style uh, because I have lots of uh, also uh, images, basically, of algorithms. And uh, <coughs> I want to today really go into the guts, basically, of gravitational n-body solvers and how you make them fast and, and sufficiently accurate um, for real-world applications. So <coughs> on Monday, I discussed at some length the of lazov system, the collisionist Boltzmann equation coupled to self-gravity. This is really what we are interested in, in uh, collisionist dynamics. Uh, we're interested in this set of equations both for the dark matter uh, fluid, if you like, uh, if you treat it as a collisionist fluid, um, and in the stars and galaxies uh, <coughs> of all sizes. And we are going to approximate this system by an embody system. And that's conceptually now very simple. We replace this complicated set of integral partial differential equations with a set of ordinary differential equations, which just follow the orbits of n particles in their mutual gravitational field. That's the, the classic n body problem with the only uh, slight sophistication, which is really a minor one, is the introduction here of a gravitational softening length on small scales. The problem here is that the n that we're talking about should really better be very, very large. And when I talk, when you say large here, I mean, you know, millions or even billions. And then the sum here, uh, the force sum, becomes a real nightmare because you have a genuine n squared problem. Um, and for a million or a billion, you can't e evaluate easily this double sum that you effectively have for every particle. You would have to uh, sum the forces from all the other particles. So the central issues that uh, you, you encounter, or maybe the most central issue in embody, collisions and body dynamics is this one. How do we compute the gravitational forces efficiently and accurately? That's not the only issue. The, the other one is, is also very important and has got to remain discussed this very nicely yesterday. How do we integrate the orbital equations in time? There's a, lar you know, there's a large variety of integration schemes and uh, if you pick the wrong one, you can greatly degrade the quality of your, your integration. And also of extreme importance is uh, the issue of how to generate appropriate initial conditions. Because it certainly is true that if you know, garbage, garbage in, garbage out, your simulation will only be as good as your initial conditions in the, in the best possible case. So this is an issue that you have to be absolutely fanatic about and pay great attention. And then finally, as we'll see, uh, the problem to paralyze calculations in collision <coughs> dynamics is a difficult one because of the long-range nature of the gravitational field, uh, which is kind of an, the anticlimax to parallelization, really, because we can't really uh, decouple the system in many decoupled pieces. Uh, they will always stay tightly coupled, and that's going to be uh, a major nightmare for parallelization. So, since I didn't get through this topic of initial conditions generation uh, on Monday, I want to finish this, this up here briefly. First of all, uh, coming back to collision sports equations, sometimes you would like to uh, study systems that are initially in more or less in, in, in a static equilibrium. For example, you'd like to set up a galaxy on your computer and do an experiment with it, collide it with another galaxy, say, or drop it into a galaxy cluster. In this case, you would like to start with initial conditions that are already a solution of the collision Boltzmann equation. And the easiest case here is, of course, to construct static solutions, even though that's also not particularly easy. But there are a few theorems that you can exploit. And one important one is uh, the so-called gene theorem. And that uh, starts out from the observation that if you have an integral of motion that is some function of uh, the phase space variables that's constant along the orbits, so then you have an integral of motion, then this integral of motion is basically a solution of the collision Boltzmann equation. That's because the collision Boltzmann equation is exactly this convective derivative along the orbit uh, of the phase space distribution function is zero. So the i is going to be a solution of the CBE. And in fact, you can convince yourself that there's basically equivalence between the solutions of the collision Boltzmann equation and such integrals of motion, or in other words, uh, static solutions of the collision Boltzmann equation only depend on the phase space variables through integrals of motion. And then the simplest uh, 
possible dependence basis is that the collision Boltzmann equation only depends on the energy of uh, particles. And these energies along an orbit are, of course, constant in static potential. And uh, you can then construct for spherical systems, you can show that uh, it's a complicated derivation, which is in, Scott book, in Scott's book. You can uh, invoke Eddington, Eddington's formula to essentially calculate the distribution function from the given spherically symmetric density distribution. Actually, a physical solution doesn't exist for all possible density distributions. There are certain restrictions on it. But if you have a well-behaved, say, spherically concentrated density profile, then usually uh, you're probably going to have a solution. And here's one example, the Hernquist halo. This is a model that's sometimes used for cold dark matter halos, also for stellar bulge, it's quite useful. This is spherically symmetric mass distribution. And you see this um, density profile has an inner slope of r to the minus one. It has a power law cusp in the inner parts. And then at large radii, it decays like r to the fourth. And it's actually quite similar to the NFW halo, except that it, dec that it declines much faster at the outer radii, and so has a finite mass. And you can calculate then a distribution function. And these are then complicated analytic formula like this one. And even for this very simple density distribution, it, you already have something like this. So there are only a very handful of models that you can treat analytically that way. But they are then extremely useful because you have an exact distribution function. In practice, you very often, however, don't get away with this if you want to make a more realistic model for uh, a galaxy, say, composed of a dark matter halo, a stellar disk of your choice, a stellar bulge, maybe gaseous disk, maybe a central supermassive black hole. And such models have then certain structural properties. Uh, this is, for example, illustrated here in this circle velocity diagram. This is just measuring the uh, square root of the enclosed mass over R, basically, the circle velocity at any given radius. And that's a very useful uh, diagnostic plot to, to show you where each mass component is important. And you see here, for example, the dark matter halo, and the disk, the, the bulge, very concentrated. And then you get a total rotation curve, for example, that's comparatively flat. Now, to <coughs> initialize a static uh, n-body model that sort of uh, re reproduces this initially, uh, and but also keeps it, you, you have to work out um, the velocity distribution somehow approximately. And there are different techniques for it, but um, one technique that I'll briefly show you is, is basically based on the Jeans equations, based on the moment equations um, from the collision boltzmann equation. And it, it basically goes like this. You start out with more or less uh, mass distributions of your choice. Say, for example, you could take, again, a, a Hernquist halo or an NFW profile for the dark matter distribution. We can put stars in an in a exponential disk where the surface mass density decays exponentially. And the vertical structure we could describe, uh, say, with an isothermal sheet. Um, this is this sec h squared function here. This is essentially in the vertical direction. It looks a bit like a, more or less like a Gaussian. And that's the infinite uh, sheet approximation here that you apply locally simply here in the disk. But let's assume that we then have this three-dimensional stellar mass density. You can invoke, uh, say, a bulge, put also gas in the disk, and so on. And for the gas, you have then uh, not the collision of Boltzmann equation, but the hydrostatic equilibrium equation here in the vertical direction. Um, and the, the challenge is now to, first of all, you want to initialize and body realizations of all these mass distributions. And the more challenging thing is then to give them the right velocities such that they self-consistently uh, fulfill the collision Boltzmann equation. And as I said, this is very hard in general to find a solution, a static solution. Uh, but you get away with often uh, by just approximately uh, determining, for example, moments of the velocity distribution function. And for axisymmetric models, you can, in, you can actually do this with the Jeans equations because due to symmetries, then several of the moments vanish. You can actually use the Jeans equations then, for example, to calculate the radial and the vertical uh, velocity dis dispersions in these uh, mass models. And <coughs> doing this, uh, you then assume for simplicity that maybe, or that's, that's then the, the usual assumption that's often made, that you approximate at every given point in space the real velocity distribution function with a triaxial Gaussian. And if that's reasonably correct, you, all you need is really the, the first and the second moments. And those you get from either from symmetry arguments or from uh, solutions of the Jeans equations. And in the stellar disk, you have to make 
few additional assumptions. You invoke epicycle theory or so to, to get a more accurate model. But basically, this is how uh, you can construct uh, compound galaxy models that are approximately in equilibrium. They will not be uh, perfect solutions of the collisions Boltzmann equation initially. So if you put them onto a computer like this, they are um, going to relax briefly for 100 million years or so to settle down. And the new density profiles will then be hopefully very close to what you desired initially. And that's for some applications good enough. So if you do this, you can then use galaxy models to, to do interesting astrophysics. And um, for example, you can use them to uh, smash them together on a computer in galaxy collisions. This is a very important area where body models are used and um, still one that's extremely active. Uh, why is this so? I, I, I um, can show you here a few observational images of interacting galaxy, galaxies obtained with the Hubble Space Telescope. And we see obviously that there are usually two partners involved and they're in some kind of interaction producing tidal tails and so on. And um, the, co the relation to modern computer simulations is, is very nicely illustrated by this movie here that Frank Summers made at the Hubble, at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And that's showing you uh, an, a body simulation of a collision of two spiral galaxies. In fact, this is a, a somewhat old simulation by Lars Hernquist and Chris Nios. And Frank Summers just reused this and um, looked at various times of this galaxy interaction, compared it like this with real observational <coughs> images of, of interacting galaxies. And I think this um, animation makes one point very striking, um, that these galaxies are really in the process of, of merging and interacting, and that these features are indeed tidal tails, and <coughs> that we, we see uh, galaxies all over the place that are in the process of merging. Right? Now, for you, it might be, may be completely normal, but um, you know, 30 years ago or so, this was, was a radical idea. And in fact, Ala Tumre, who's here, he put this forward, the merge hypothesis, a bold move <laughs> at the time. And it was you know, hard to convince observational astronomers of this, but I think um, this is absolutely compelling in my view that this is really what's going on. And actually, this is just a modern version of um, what we see here. This is the famous paper by Truman Truman from 72, which already showed this point. And it's basically the very same thing using restricted three-body simulations. Here's a model of the interaction of M51, NGC 5195, view, viewed from different orientations. And that paper uh, basically contains not only one of the first simulations, basically, that, that completely led to a pi paradigm shift in astrophysics, but it also makes this point, uh, I think, um, what makes, it makes also another point, I think, that you can do amazing things um, with very small particle numbers with, if you combine it with um, you know, physical intuition and insight. And I think that's, that's very important. Here's another example for that. Somewhat later from 1985, so this is one of the first cold dark matter cosmological simulations from Davis, F. Stuff, your Frank and White using just 32 cube particles, right? Very small number, and that's kind of the large scale structure they got. But they managed to extract from this a lot of results which hold up to the very day, today, right? So they got correct results out of this. We wouldn't even bother to look at this these days, right? But you can uh, get out amazing things with, with low resolution if you combine it with physical insight and intuition. I think that's something we, we, we need to remember because um, you cannot compensate for lack of this with, with good resolution, right? So you always have to have this, otherwise you can't do, do real physics. And you know, they were really efficient, right? I mean, they basically get one citation per particle, right? Sort of, well, they're close to it at least. And the modern version of this is, is something like this. You see the result basically hasn't changed. Uh, it's just much more accurate. You see the shoulder and the correlation function that we get with something like the Millennium Simulation today. So for the initial conditions of these cosmological simulations, you'd have to do a few different things, and I'll briefly want to discuss those too. Of course, we know now uh, the initial conditions of structure formation in the universe extremely accurately. At least in the lambda-cedium cosmology, we essentially know them perfectly. The microwave background fluctuations that you see here, 
um, together with lots of other observations, they are essentially perfectly matched by a, a, a minimal six-parameter model of the Lambda CDM cosmology, which is our standard, standard uh, model. Of course, it has these two ugly points that we don't know what the dark matter and dark energy are, but um, we know the, the amounts that we need to put in to get, get all of these observations explained. And then in this sort of uh, minimal model, we, we have uh, you know, observations not only on the microwave background here on large scales. This is the linear power spectrum measured on um, different sort of scales. We, we have these days galaxies, of course, clusters of galaxies, weak lensing, line alpha forest, and all of this gives a beautifully consistent picture, um, more or less, at least um, broadly speaking, of, of what's going on, right? I mean, we are still of course have lots of gaps in the understanding, but um, we have a good understanding now of what the initial conditions in the standard model are, and one can calculate the power spectrum of primordial fluctuations very accurately with so-called Boltzmann codes, for example, then these are the theoretical models here in red that are here fitted to um, um, the observation data from the CMB, and you get, you use codes, codes like CMB fast or so to calculate the power spectrum or transfer functions um, respectively, that, that you need for that. And what you basically need to start out with for cosmological simulation is with a, a, a transfer function or power spectrum calculated with one of these uh, Boltzmann codes for the very early universe. And they use as input the cosmological parameters, meaning the mean mass density uh, in dark matter, the baryonic density, the um, dark energy density, and the Hubble rate, and uh, that's almost it, and the tilt. Um, say, of the primordial spectrum. So for our purposes as embody simulators at late times, which, which is sort of my, my arena, um, we take this as input for further studies then of the nonlinear structure formation. So this is all linear theory, what you see here in these simulation results. And uh, the first thing then you have to settle on is, is uh, the amplitude of the power spectrum. There's no way that, to, uh, that we have to predict this theoretically at the moment. So we uh, empirically set an amplitude um, match to observational data. And you can basically take this linear power spectrum since all the modes um, grow with the same rate. You can just scale it up or down um, arbitrarily at late times in the linear regime. Um, and <coughs> you just set basically the prefactor such that you have um, variance filtered on a certain scale that, that's uh, as large as you as you desire, and the common scale, of course, is the sigma, is the eight megaparsec scale, which is uh, roughly the, uh, the, the, ma the region out of which a cluster collapses or so, and that's a scale that's only, uh, that's all more or less still linear, it's mildly nonlinear, it's getting mildly nonlinear or so at, at uh, today's time. And then the observation constraints are something like sigma uh, eight in this so sort of range. So, once you have normalized your power spectrum such that it fulfills that constraint that you get the right normalization when extrapolated to redshift zero in, with linear theory, then you have, uh, you know basically the spectrum of fluctuations and its amplitude in any given redshift. You just use the growth factor to scale it to any given redshift that you want. So you are uh, all set up to initialize a random realization of such a universe on a computer. But how do we do this now in, in practice? <coughs> We need to start out with a universe that's unperturbed, that's completely smooth, um, and contains our matter um, in an unperturbed state, and then we want to imprint on it the primordial fluctuations that come out of the inflationary theory. And so <coughs> we have there essentially two choices, and that's what, what's used in practice uh, these days. Either you start with a Cartesian grid of particles, and that's obviously uh, good approximation of a homogeneous density field. Or you start with something slightly more sophisticated, so-called glass. So this is, um, you know, uh, not a random distribution of particles. A random distribution would have a lot of white noise, would be a Poisson sample, and would look much more irregular than this. This is a, a pseudo-regular particle distribution generated by taking a Poisson sample and reversing the sign of gravity and evolving it for a while. So the particles repel until they settle down. You know, we have to damp, damp out some of the motions to, to get this, this, this pseudo-equilibrium until they settle down basically in this uh, irregular setup where you have, you know, not any preferred direction like in this Cartesian grid. 
but you have this sort of amorph state where um, the particles more or less arrange themselves on, a, on an irregular, uh, equally with equal distances on in the mean to, e to each other. And this is avoiding preferred directions um, of collapse and um, it, you know, in, in it has advantages in that sense that, that you uh, avoid spurious correlations that, that are sort of very strong here on the mean interparticle spacing and here they are smeared out a bit more on the scale of the mean interparticle spacing. So once we have this unperturbed particle distribution, we need to, Im we need to imprint on it um, displacements that then realize density fluctuations, right? So we can, of course, create density fluctuations by moving the particles a bit away from their starting position. That's what we're going to do. And then we need to add also uh, velocities. And in cold dark matter cosmologies, the initial velocity dispersion is negligibly small. So these particles will only have basically a mean streaming velocity. They will, uh, in, at the initial time, have just uh, a unique velocity at a given point. And that's what we are going to assign to these particles. How do you do this um, from the power spectrum? Well, you uh, define, first of all, uh, a particle displacement. That's what you want to know. So we have particles at some so-called Lagrangian coordinate. That's the initial. I don't want to install anything now. <laughs> um, at the Lagrangian position QI, and um, that's going to be our perturbed new coordinate, and so the difference is your displacement vector. And the goal is that we need to calculate that so that we can move the particles at this displacement to, to the uh, unperturbed coordinate, and we get the initial, um, the initial particle position. And you do this via uh, something called the Seldrich approximation. So first of all, you, you look, um, Basically, what is the, the density around the new coordinate x? And <coughs> that will be related to the constant original density in the unperturbed state, um, divided here by the <coughs> Jacobian here of the mapping. And so you can calculate this Jacobian. And then you see that if the displacements are small, this is just 1 plus the divergence with respect to q of the displacements. Uh <coughs> and then uh, you can use that to say, OK, that I'm using this approximation, then the density fluctuations, the contrast of the density with respect to the background over theory, there's a zero missing over three, no, um, row zero, is minus the di this divergence here. <coughs> and then you know that during linear growth, um, this equation needs, uh, holds during linear growth, and you know that the, del the, um, you know, the linear density contrast grows with some function with the growth factor in time, then also displacements was, must grow with the same rate, such that this can stay fulfilled. And from this, uh, by basically combining these two things in here, um, you can work out that the x dot, uh, the velocity, is just, of course, d dot, and it's given by this term. Now, this looks uh, maybe you know, not yet too familiar, but you can put in more familiar things here. You see a dot over a, that's the Hubble rate. And then this thing here um, is just the logarithmic derivative of the linear growth factor, d log d over d log a. And at early times, you always base in einstein sido model. This is more or less one, typically. But there's a good approximation to this dependence for also for low-density cosmologies, which is omega to the 0.6, which is often used. So if you use this sort of Seldovich approximation, you can now relate the initial velocities of the particles to the displacement. In fact, they're in the same direction. The particles <coughs> move in the direction of the displacement. And the displacement field you calculate with Fourier methods. So if you write down a Laplacian of some field as delta, then you can derive the displacement as the gradient of this phi. So that's how we are um, going to do it in, in practice in setting up initial conditions. So we make a Fourier realization of the displacement field the following way. You basically know uh, from your power spectrum, you know uh, the mode delta, k, each mode delta k, you know its mean expected amplitude, and we assume that we have a Gaussian random field. That is, we can draw random numbers for, for example, for the phase, which is random between 0 and 2 pi for every mode. And then the amplitude has a mean expectation value. Of, of the delta squared, which is uh, the power spectrum, but there's actually also a, dis, uh, a distribution around the mean, which is a Rayleigh distribution function. You, so you draw an amplitude from a Rayleigh distribution to 
have uh, the amplitude and also the phase of each of these complex numbers delta k. And <coughs> in Fourier space, this is a, a simple algebraic equation. So you get the phi k's of this field, gives you the displacement field is d chi, is, is just the derivative of this, it's i k over k squared delta k. And then you go back, sorry, this is not a, not a k, this is dx in real space. The field is then the Fourier transform of these um, density um, fluctuation in Fourier space. So the, again, the philosophy is here that you treat each mode as independent and uh, with a random phase and an amplitude given by the power spectrum, and then you can initialize that way a displacement field and the velocities you get by the Seldovich approximation. What's important to uh, realize, however, is that we are living usually on a periodic universe in doing this, so we, we, we uh, constrain our universe to be living in a box of psi length L, and then we use that box to tessellate an infinite space. And that means that also the Fourier transform of this uh, is, uh, or in Fourier space, we don't have a discrete space, uh, we don't have a continuous space, we have a discrete space. So the possible Fourier modes that exist for this periodic box are these little uh, dots here. And if I can, uh, and they have a certain spacing, and the spacing between these dots is two pi over L, right? That's the fundamental uh, wave number in <coughs> for this box. And <coughs> what this means is that I, I need to draw a, a wave by delta k for each of these um, modes here, subject, however, to first of all a reality constraint, right? That the con conjugate um, of it must be essentially the negative. So I, I can basically only populate a half plane here of this space with independent modes. If, if they're complex, then the, the, the other half plane is then given by the reality constraint. And then the other issue is how far can you go out in, in this space? So the Fourier space here uh, extends infinitely, so you have just this grid, but if you go further out, you get smaller and smaller waves. <coughs> but you cannot uh, just do this and, and think that I, I just take a huge Fourier transform and I populate a uh, humongous number of waves here and then Fourier transform back and you're going to get an accurate displacement field, that would be a stu not a good idea because you then make a serious mistake. You, you neglect the fact that you have only a certain number of points, mass points in your real space and they, sample will, they will sample the displacement field and that, <laughs> according to the sampling theorem, puts uh, constraints on the smallest wave that you can represent that can't be small, shorter basically than the mean particle spacing. And so <coughs> that translates in Fourier space to Nyquist frequency which is, which is 2 pi L times n half where n is the uh, particle number per dimension. Uh, of course you can also go to minus, minus n half. And that means that you effectively are constrained to a box here in Fourier space in which you are allowed to populate modes. If you extend that, then you will get artificial aliasing of power back into their fundamental cube, and that's basically implementing then a distorted power spectrum, which you don't want. Um, another issue that's sometimes done uh, is that now once you have that, that you can populate the Fourier uh, amp modes in this box, um, sometimes people restrict this region that's actually populated to a smaller region, to a sphere, sort of in an attempt to avoid um, that certain directions allow shorter wave numbers along the diagonal because the unit, the vector length gets longer here than in this direction. Um, so you can sometimes, sometimes people restrict themselves to a, to a sphere or a circle in 2D to initialize these waves. So that was all I, I want to say about um, <coughs> initial conditions. So as I said, it's an important topic. Back to the topic of forces, not not of smaller importance. So we have an n squared complexity in the direct summation approach. Now this direct summation is, uh, in one respect, it's quite unique because it's the only method really that gives you the force exactly. Right. If you want to get rid of this method, you usually, it usually means that you have to, you have to sacrifice some, some accuracy. So you're not going to get, um, if you have a faster method than this, um, in the gravitation and body problem, you usually end up with approximations to the true force. And then the question, the first question one has to ask is, is that sufficient? Are approximate force calculations actually good enough? 
And <coughs> the basic answer here is yes. Provided in the collisionist dynamics, that's usually good enough, provided that the force errors are random and are sufficiently small. Right? Of course, it doesn't help much if you have uh, force errors all over the place of 1,000% or so. That's not uh, going to be good. So they have to be you know, small enough, so maybe a few percent. And then if these force errors are even a percent, but completely randomly distributed and not correlated with you know, along an orbit or with other particles, then they are pretty benign, basically. They don't do much. They are completely fine in a collision system. That's, you can show that they only, these force errors only reduce the relaxation time a bit. In fact, if you have a 1% force error, the relaxation time becomes shorter by about a percent. So that's not bad. That's okay, right? Because the n-body problem is anyway very noisy. And uh, so random, small random errors don't matter. But um, systematic errors in the force are of course much worse. So if you, for example, consistently get a force that's too small or too big, or if forces are, force errors are correlated along an orbit or with certain spatial, uh, say whatever, a grid direction or something like this, that's going to introduce real artifacts in a calculation. Unfortunately, this is very difficult to separate in practice, so to guarantee that force errors are truly random is normally not possible, right? So you, what you basically have to do is to just make the force errors small enough and hope for the best. Uh, that's, that's, um, and then you experiment, you know, what's, what's good enough. Now, just a slide that uh, Mike Norman again showed, this is sort of historic record of uh, cosmological and body simulation. You see this sort of Moore's law growth. Um, and the Moore's law, this doubling time of uh, 18 months or so in the, in the number of transistors and of CPUs, we actually, the astrophysicists, they, they have exploited this pretty well. So the doubling time here is of that order, 17 months or so. Um, and you then think, oh, okay, we all have been slackers. We just relied on the computers to get faster. But actually, that's not true, right? You see that also the algorithms have changed along the sequence. And in fact, they had to change because the computational cost of the n-body problem is not proportional to the number of particles normally. Because if you use the more particles, uh, even if you have a force algorithm that is proportional to the particle number in, in computation complexity, you're going to do more time steps. Right, so it's more, in, realistically, it's more like n to the four thirds or so. So the fact that, nevertheless, this sort of trend could track the growth in computer power means that this was only possible because the computational paradigms have been improved as well. Right, the algorithms have gotten faster and faster and parallelization has come in, etc. Now, um, direct summation, just to make this, this, this a bit drastic, what, how, how bad this is, really, in, in practice. Suppose you're happy with your grade board or you have a dump algorithm implemented on a GPU, which does this direct summation, and then you're happy, and you can maybe do uh, a million particles with a, with a month of, of integration time with direct summation. And then you would like to do something like the uh, most recent calculation with 10 to the 10 particles, then with this method, it would take you 10 million years. Right? So that's how bad n squared scaling is. You really have to, to do something, something better. So one of the uh, original methods, and still one of the most popular ones for good reasons, is particle mesh force calculation. <coughs> so what's this? So the, <coughs> as it says, you know, in the name, uh, besides the particles, a mesh, mesh is coming in into the game. And <coughs> what you would like to exploit is essentially uh, the convolution theorem because you can see, of course, that the uh, gravitational potential is fundamentally a convolution of the mass density field with some Green's function. And <coughs> the Green's function in the uh, Newtonian case is, is very simple. It's just basically 1 over x, right? <coughs> if you plug this in, this Green's function up there, then you get back the, the Newtonian potential. And now you know from the convolution theorem that if I Fourier transform a convolution equation like this into Fourier space, then it becomes a simple product of the Fourier transforms of these two things that are convolved with each other. And that's how one solves efficiently convolutions. One Fourier transform them, multiplies the two things together, Fourier transforms back. And that's the idea of particle mesh to solve uh, with Fourier methods this convolution. 
I show you later, there's also another, mess, another approach to, to solve the potential in real space on a mesh, which is also used. But this is the Fourier method, which is very important. So this involves obviously a couple of steps. So we, we want to solve for the potential in the following steps. Um, well, actually, first of all, yeah, let me go through this list here on the right. Four steps of the PM algorithm. We first need to come up with a density field to begin with, right? Because if we start out with particles, so we go onto a mesh that's called the density assignment. We, we go with from the particles onto the mesh. Then we calculate the potential somehow. From the potential, we can determine the force fields. And then we need to assign the forces to particles because the force field will be then again on a mesh, but we really have particles, so we need to calculate somehow forces at the particle coordinates. And then the, the step here, B, the computation of the potential involves the Fourier transforms, and that's going like this, that you Fourier transform the density field, you multiply with the Green's function in Fourier space, and then you Fourier transform backwards, and you're done. That's, that's the idea of the potential solver. So let me go a bit more through the steps. The, the density assignment um, is done like this. You have a mesh with uh, mesh sizes H, and you have a set of discrete mesh uh, centers, say XM, and then of course you have particles XI or so, that uh, and the XI are the particle coordinates. And then one, one way to look at this is that one conceptually gives each particle kind of a shape, S of X, and then to each mesh cell, we assign the fraction of the mass that falls into the cell. That is, we, we calculate basically overlap of this particle shape with a mesh cell. And <coughs> that's uh, shown here. So the, um, this is the, um, actually this is the shape function W here. We can use um, different assignment functions which are themselves basically convolution of the, the cell shape pi here and, and the, the, the particle shape s. And then the density on the mesh is the sum of these contributions that each particle has with a given assignment function. So we write the density at the mesh center is basically the sum here of uh, particle contributions um, or the sum all each of each particle's contribution to a given mesh cell comes a bit clearer if you look at the, the possible shape functions that are in use. So um, simplest shape function is basically a point or a Dirac delta function, so um, you don't really make the particle any broader. And then you just assign the whole mass of the point to whatever grid cell it falls into. That's called the nearest grid point assignment. And here you... Uh, uh, touch basically only one cell per particle. And um, this is something that's usually not used at all because of the low order this has, because that uh, method basically disregards any information you have um, about a particle's coordinate within the cell, right? And also then if a, s if a particle moves from one cell to the next, the force it generates will jump discontinuously. And that's uh, not a good thing, so you only have a piecewise constant force. So that's why this NGP is uh, rarely used uh, at all, even though it's principle valid. What's used much more often is clouds in cells. So here you basically have a shape function that's of a point that's equal to uh, the cell itself, like a square or a cube. And you then uh, have an overlap of this cube with typically in 2D with four and 3D with eight, eight mesh points, uh, mesh cells. And um, you then split up the mass that way and that produces a piecewise um, linear force, and that's, not, that's then staying continuous um, when a particle changes the mesh cell, and that's already much, much better. Then uh, you can go to higher and higher orders, triangular-shaped clouds, as it says. It's uh, a triangle, basically, that covers at the base two cells, and then you work out how much overlap this pyramid has, basically, with the cells it touches, and there will be, in general, 27, cells that are touched in three dimensions. Um, that scheme is of higher order and that produces then continuous first derivatives in the force. Um, and you can go further, right? There are higher order schemes that, that get uh, 
that which have a more, uh, more support, you know, touch more and more cells, and that will in 3D rapidly grow, right? So then you have four cubed and so on. And in practice, this then you know, becomes quickly more expensive because you, you have to spread the points over so many cells. And so uh, one basically never uses really higher order than this, uh, often even goes to this for issues basically of speed. Um, because you don't need this uh, smoothness properties for collision dynamics often, uh, <coughs> and certainly not at, at higher than, than third order. Uh, we use for SBH base it next in the sequence of um, uh, with with uh, basically where the base is basically four H uh, long. That that's interesting. So for SBH we kind of use a, a still higher order kernel than this, but for the collisionist dynamics this is what's used as assignment function. So then, <coughs> uh, once we have the density field, as I said, we, we use just the Fourier transforms to, to go to a gravitational potential. That's then on the grid. And from the grid, we need to get the forces. Um, and so we approximate the different, the gradient operator by finite differencing. And there are different finite, different schemes available. Uh, here's the same story. If you want to go to higher order differencing, you have to do more work. The stencil becomes larger that you look at in, in each dimension, and so it becomes more costly. Here, for example, this is simple um, second order <coughs> accurate differencing where you sit at a point and you look at the left and the right of you, uh, take the difference, divide by twice the cell size, but you can also look at two neighbors left and right and get so here, for example, a fourth order accurate finite difference scheme for the, for the force field. So that's what you basically apply to every point in every direction, and so that way you get the full force field at the grid, grid itself. And then finally, you need to interpolate the mesh forces to the particle locations, and that uh, is important here. Um, you, you know it, that you use the same um, interpolation function that was used in the density assignment. So if you used um, um, say nearest grid point, you would just take the force in, uh, of one of the points where you're nearest. If you take CIC, clouds and cells, you would have basic B-linear interpolation of the, from the, the surrounding mesh grid points to get your force. And one can show that this is required such that uh, you basically have force anti-symmetry between two particles and that gives you momentum conservation. So this is some property that you would like to, like to have. Yes? Yeah, you, you can do three Fourier transforms to come back, right? That's, uh, you mean, you mean here? Yeah, you can take the derivative in Fourier space, right? So, so what he means is um, similar to this, right? So I can get, I can get, say, the derivative here in Fourier space by just multiplying with the IK vector, right? Then you can, uh, but the, the disadvantage here is that for each component, you need to make a Fourier transform back, right? So you have three Fourier transforms back to get the forces. That's okay, you can do that. It just turns out that uh, this is more expensive and doesn't give you really better accuracy. That's why it's usually better to difference in real space. So you get away with one Fourier transform and you still have good enough accuracy. So if you, for example, I've tested this myself at some point, if you have, um, for example, if you use the fourth order scheme, then uh, you basically, especially for the 3PM algorithm, that's, that's totally good enough. So you don't need to do three Fourier transforms and you save, speed, save time that way. Um, right. So the... <laughs> yeah. Okay, right. I mean, there are different vari variants, and sometimes you need to do this. Yeah, that's. I, uh, I didn't mean to say that this is universally uh, the right way to do it, but there are different approaches. Yeah. Um, so advantages and disadvantages of PM. Well, the the uh, there's one very good, important pro uh, for it. That's the s the speed which is basically fantastic. It's absolutely blazingly fast compared to other methods, and it's also very simple. 
The problems with it are that the spatial force resolution is, is limited to the mesh size. So for example, you know, we can't really put a uh, gravitation softening smaller than mesh size. Well, it's, it's kind of futile because the effective gravitation softening that we get is basically something like the mesh size or some multiple of it of the order of one and a half or so, just because from the uh, broadening effect of the mass assignment. And, and of course, we obviously can't see structure inside the cells. And um, also there are some moderate issue that the force errors on the grid scale it seems itself is, is not per perfectly uh, isotropic. It's not a serious problem. We could live with this, but really the serious problem is that cosmological simulations cluster strongly and have a very large dynamic range. So, and it's very hard to uh, make the PM mesh fine enough to basically resolve internal structure of halos everywhere, as well as the large cosmological scales. So because you basically run out of memory, and also then if you use such a large mesh, as, as we discussed earlier, the great typical force resolution you want to achieve is a, a 30th or so of the mean particle spacing. Right? So if you have a, say, 256 cube particle simulation, you would like to use, uh, if you want to treat this purely with PM, uh, a 30 times bigger Fourier mesh in each dimension. So you would have 30 cubed in front, and that's a huge factor, which you can't do. And then if you try to do that, if you have the memory, then it also actually becomes slow because it's such a huge Fourier transform at that point. So that's why also other, um, other methods are actually uh, in use a lot that, that go around this problem of um, the restricted resolution. And one historically one of the uh, most first and, and very important schemes is, is our so-called particle, 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 particle mesh schemes, PQDEM. And there the idea is basically briefly that you want to supplement the particle mesh force with a direct summation short range force at the scale of the mesh cells. And you know, then you have some technical things, chaining cell and so on to find these neighbors quickly. So basically the idea is that if you're in a, you, you don't see, you don't get forces from your neighbors in the same cell you, through the PM algorithm, but you can maybe do direct summation over these particles and since there are only a few of them, in the cell, that's not very, that's reasonably fast, right? So you can do this. Um, again, sort of the Achilles heel of this is that if the clustering is very strong, maybe it's not true anymore that there are few particles in the cell. There might then be many, and then you get slow again. Then you get an n squared behavior. And that's in fact the reason why very, very early on, adaptive p cubed m schemes were invented, where, for example, you place secondary grids or even third order grids. Um, in some fashion or, or another onto clustered regions, right? To basically there beat down the the particle particle uh, clumping that slows you down. And that has been used uh, successfully in a number of cosmological codes. Um, there are also other um, important ways to solve uh, for the potential, not using Fourier methods really, but you can also um, iteratively actually solve for the potential in, in real space on the grid directly. And that works with, for example, with finite difference approximations to the Laplacian. And you, you can, this is basically a Poisson's equation with a sort of finite difference Laplacian. And if you have the density field on the grid and some whatever guess for the potential, then you can calculate a new potential with this formula and then this is going to be a better approximation to the solution than the old one, and then you can iterate this. And that way you can also create uh, a potential, and especially if you maybe have already from the last time step an idea what the potential is, this iteration is maybe not so bad. Even though in general, it turns out that the uh, elimination of errors here is, uh, is good, is the, the con convergence or the, the error is quickly reduced, for uh, small scale errors on a few cells, but if you have longer range fluctuations in your potential, so if it's not a good guess, they will die out very slowly with this, so it then becomes very expensive to iterate it. And then there are very tricky and interesting ways to actually make progress here, so-called multi-grid methods. That's uh, uh, where you now take this, uh, this observation and do first, um, something that you, that you basically coarsen the resolution of the mesh. You do this recursively, in fact. You coarsen it to a much lower resolution mesh, and there you iterate the potential to uh, a solution, and since there are fewer cells, the long range 
error will die out quickly. And then you prolong this again to a finer uh, grid, and you basically go down in a so-called V-cycle, again to the smaller scales, and in each level you, you damp out basically uh, fluctuations that are left or errors in the, in the solution. And these are very elegant methods also to, to get iterative solutions to this. And, and some codes actually use this. And there's, on, especially in, in the AMR community, I think there's a whole variety of things people do. Uh, also combinations of such real space postal solvers with Fourier methods. Fourier methods may be applied only at the top level, also in, in intermediate levels, or uh, Fourier on the top level combined with something like this, or some variant of multigrid, or in several levels Fourier methods only the base level. Something like this. So there, there are, you know, there are different um, compromises one can make for for speed and accuracy. But that's um, that's what's usually used for meshes. <coughs> so then I come come to tree algorithms. Maybe one one problem that before I come to tree algorithms that I want to mention is one of the uh, problematic points about the mesh, even so they're, they're very clean, is of course there are certain decisions you have to make. For example, whether or not you place a refinement here is kind of some maybe runtime decision, depending on parameters, and then you get a situation where then the force resolution here is maybe a different one from the force resolution here. Right? So you get weird correlations maybe of force resolution with spatial coordinate, and that can cause problems. And also, if you place a refinement, then you do a, make a discontinuous change sometimes in the force law, you suddenly start resolving finer scales, and that's actually a non-Hamiltonian perturbation. So whenever you change that, you change actually the Hamiltonian of the system, and that has uh, an intrinsic danger to, to create some artifacts. So three algorithms have one important um, advantage here that they manage to get a homogeneous force resolution everywhere, <coughs> independent of clustering. And now let me explain how this is achieved. <coughs> so here the idea is that we approximate the force on the point with a multipole expansion. <coughs> and based on a hierarchy of, of multipoles, and they are created by a so-called tree walk, uh, by a hierarchical grouping of the particles. And this hierarchical grouping is nothing else as an adaptive mesh, if you want. Right? But it's uh, not called an adaptive mesh, usually it's called a tree. And <coughs> what you do here is that you have a bunch of particles, and you first of all, you enclose them into a cube, um, which is, say, of course, if uh, it's a cosmological simulation, it's just your simulation box. And then you subdivide this cube. In 2D, you would subdivide it in, in four in the middle. And you can also do other subdivisions, but I, I focused here on this so-called Barnes and Hutt tree, uh, tree. So you make a, an oct um, in, 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 in 2D, this is a quad tree, because you, you, will, you will subdivide the, the base node, this cube, into four daughter cubes um, of a quarter of the size. And then you keep going like this. So you keep subdividing this into ever smaller pieces, always half-half, and in 3D you do it along 3x, then you get an oct tree. <coughs> and you do this until you end up with a cell that contains only one particle. And that's when, when you stop. So that's the leaf of the tree. So very simple concept. So what does that gain you <coughs> then? That's exactly the, the, this, the important point. Yeah, that's good. Thanks for pointing this out. So if you have a, I mean, it's not so clear in this cartoon. Anyway, here's not the full uh, subdivision. But if you have a cluster of points, there you will need to generate many more cells. And they will be, be smaller, because they are the mean part of the spacing. And they will be smaller at the end, will be shorter. And so you have uh, fewer cells. But the total number of cells will be related to the particle number. Right? And in fact, it will be essentially constant, independent of how the particles are arranged. So <coughs> here's this, this shown again. So you, you have, for example, in two dimensions in a plane, you have a couple of points. You subdivide this further, and you get basically a mesh hierarchy until each point is in, in one cell. And then you store that tree 
how it's called, such that you can kind of walk it, right? So I, I need to know for each of these squares, what are the descendants, which boxes um, are inside it. For example, for this guy, I would know that there are two daughters only. And for this left guy, I would then have a way to retrieve these three here. And <coughs> I don't, as you see, I don't need to store all the empty boxes. Right? So they don't need to be stored. They don't contain any mass. So once you have that grouping, this is a hierarchical grouping if you wish. The lowest level you have groups of one particles and then they, they get ba ever bigger if you go back to the main system and the first cube contains the whole system. And then you calculate multiple moments for each of these groups. So you calculate uh, the center of gravity and octomal terms and so on. And why do you do this? Well, because you then do a multiple expansion. So, so you, you want to calculate at a distant point R here, this blue point, we have a group of particles that say enclosed in one of these groups. We would like to calculate the potential created by this group of particles here. And the multiple expansion, of course, exp um, exp you know, taking basically the sum of the uh, potential of all these points and sticking in here an expansion of the denominator. And you get as a first low order term, you get the monopole moment, which is just the total mass over the distance to the center of gravity. And the dipole term will vanish if you expand around the center of gravity and you get an, an octopole uh, um, yeah, tensor here. <coughs> so you can also calculate this, this moment. And then the idea is basically the following that um, you, you do a, a force calculation that way that we, we, we have a target coordinate somewhere and then we want to calculate the force on it. We do this by walking the tree and we start at the top tree level and that is going to be something like this, a situation like this. This top tree level will be seen uh, under some opening angle theta from our vantage point. And if this angle is small enough, then the multiple approximation will be reasonably good because it's going to be this angle is basically a, a measure of the size over the distance and that's sort of the, um, the term that in which you expand this series and if there's a small number, the lowest order terms are good enough, right? If this angle is very small, you get away with the monopole term in fact and if it's a bit bigger, you maybe want to add the quadrupole, um, the oct, sorry, yeah, the quadrupole. Um, and if it's very large, then um, this series converges very slowly and you're better off to then subdividing this, Q, this region and looking at the daughter nodes, which are smaller. And there you will again test whether um, the multiple expansion is deemed to be good enough and it's deemed to be good enough if the system is say seen under a small enough angle. And uh, if it's on a small enough angle, you work out the force from the multiple expansion and then you're done. You don't need to subdivide along this branch anymore and you have accounted for all the mass that was in this group. And that basically is the, the secret of the speed up. Instead of calculating all the forces around from all these points, I calculate only one force term from the center of mass. And the prerequisite for that is that I before I start the force calculations, I need to calculate basically all the monopole and um, quadrupole tensor moments of all the groups that I have formed. Then I have them available and I can walk the tree as needed for all the particles. And here's, for example, uh, the quadrupole tensor then the moment. So that is then during the tree construction stored for each group. And then you can walk the trees uh, the tree for all the particles and you get uh, forces, force approximations that is to say. So this is a scheme that's clearly going to have a truncation error um, in the force because every uh, multiple expansion is truncated. So there will be some force error in this, in this scheme. But the tree algorithm has, has several advantages. Um, first of all, what the force accuracy, since I mentioned this, can be conveniently adjusted by a threshold parameter. You have a numerical parameter, that so-called opening angle. If you make this opening angle smaller, that says that you only allow multiple expansions that are basically seen uh, on a small enough angle, they are going to be more accurate. Um, and then you get a more accurate force, but you have to invest more work because you have to then open more of the cells. So it's then here a compromise. You can dial the force accuracy. There's basically in your code, there's a knob. You can dial it and you can get any arbitrary force accuracy. 
if you can dial, dial the force, uh, the opening angle down to zero, you get back to direct summation. But in general, you would have to dial it very far to get to this because the asymptotic, the complexity of this uh, scheme is easy to show that it's, um, for typical particle distributions that are, say, homogeneous or in a halo, then the cost per particle is of order log n, where n is the particle number. So uh, the total cost of the scheme is then n log n, and that's quite a bit uh, lower than n squared. Basically, the logarithmic factor you can usually forget, so it's effectively of order, of order n. Not quite, but um, almost. So if you calculate the forces for all particles, then the tree construction cost is negligibly small, a few percent of the total, maybe, four or five percent. So basically, if you have an uh, integration where you calculate forces for all particles, you can calculate a for, uh, reconstruct the tree every time step very fast, not a problem. There are, in, 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 in individual time step integration schemes, you sometimes, and that's actually an advantage of the tree, that if, for one reason or another, you only want the force for a certain number of particles. Say, maybe there are 4% of the particles that you're interested in, you only want the force for them. Then the uh, force calculation for this 4%, right, will be 25 times faster than the full force calculation. While for the PM algorithm, you have to basically do all or nothing, right? So you either get the full force field everywhere, and then it thanks you, you have the force at, for all the particles at no cost, but if I want to calculate the force just for, for a handful of particles, I still have the same cost, right, as for all particles. So the tree, tree is flexible in that respect. It is uh, linear in the cost uh, for the number of particles um, for which you want to have the forces. It's not quite true because there are in practice there are issues of cache performance and so on. So if you, you know, if you don't have a single loop that goes over all particles, so, but you, you skip ahead with a, um, uh, you're lapsing um, by large factors, then you, ha you, you have higher cash penalties and so on. So it's a bit, it's not completely linear in this fraction, but it's almost, and, and algebraically it is. So some of the properties are which also important. So there is no intrinsic restriction for the dynamic range of the tree algorithm because, you know, even though there's a mesh, right, the res mesh resolution it automatically adjusts to the clumping and you don't need more memory for that right, because empty cells are never stored, right, so the number of cells you need stays constant, so that is very, very convenient. Um, the force accuracy I mentioned, and the speed also does not depend uh, on the clustering state to first order. It does a bit, but not, not very much. And it is geometrically very flexible, so it's particularly good for things like these galaxy collisions, right, where maybe stuff material is, is flung out to large distances and so on. So a tree algorithm will always be able to cope with this, while with a mesh you would have to worry if stuff moves off the mesh, what to do with it and so on. There is one other important refinement of the tree algorithm, which is called the fast multiple method, and that's in some sense uh, the better way to do the tree. Um, and here you're not only expanding the multiple you're not only applying the multiple expansion um, around sort of a source term from a cube, but also the target where the <coughs> particle sits is there you also expand the field and then you channelize this. You basically do not treat particle node interactions, but you, you calculate node node interactions with an expansion of the field at both centers of masses of the node. And then you, that your tree walk is not done for every particle, but it's basically done in a double recursive fashion simultaneously for all the cells. And in that way, you can achieve a so-called fast multiple method, which is basically a, uh, also a tree code, but um, one that treats cell-cell interactions. This is even faster than the tree code, and it can also can save momentum manifestly because you then have basically um, equal force balance here between the two cells, which is not true for the for the real tree algorithm because there you have uh, basically, as I said, a force error and you're not guaranteed that all the force errors add up to zero, right? So that's not guaranteed, normally not a severe problem, but uh, it's nice to have, if you can have it, that there is manifest momentum conservation, of course. So for example, Walter Dehn did, did a code like this. But uh, one problem here is again that this doesn't work pro very well with individual time steps 
because you here again you basically have to calculate the forces either for every particle or for no particle and you can't just do it for a few percent of the particles at the fraction of the cost. So, and it's also very hard to distribute this um, on a per, um, distribute memory machine and parallelize it for it. So, but I think if, if you, one of you wants to work on tree algorithms, um, I'm not sure Walter Denen told me al already years ago that he has or works on a parallel version. I'm not sure how far he is. Maybe he has solved it by now. But I think this is something that's uh, in principle very promising. It would be much better than what's implemented in, in some code like Edge 2. Um, but it's, it's, there are some obstacles to actually make this, um, uh, scale this up to very large particle numbers and also to individual time steps. Now finally, there is another um, tree algorithm that's very popular that's called tree PM. And from the name you can tell that's now this is going to marry particle mesh schemes with tree schemes. And the idea here is basically that it's, it's basically going back to the very old P cubed M, the particle 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 mesh. P cubed M was doing direct summation on scales smaller than the mesh. And I said that this is going to get slow if there's a lot of clustering on the mesh scale. So the idea here of tree PM is to replace P the particle particle part with a tree, right? And um, let's see how this works. So there uh, you start out from basically the Poisson equation in cosmology here. This is the, here the, you see the Laplacian on the potential. Here we have the peculiar density field. And this is the, <coughs> this is what you really evaluate, the uh, sum over all periodic images, over all particles, um, uh, separated the, on, on this fiducial grid, uh, where each particle reappears at a distance of L. So this is what we want to simulate. And we do this by going in Fourier space, and if you Fourier transform this equation, you get this, phi k is four pi g over k squared, rho k, for k unequal to zero, and the k equal to zero term is exactly taken out by this minus one over L cubed. So that's how you do this in, in Fourier space. And that's how PM mesh solvers do it. And now the idea of 3PM is that <coughs> you split the potential here in two pieces by adding, uh, factoring or multiplying it, the potential here with an exponential damping factor. And we call this the long range potential. And then we subtract from the full phi k, this is what we call the long range, and we're left with the short range potential, right? So that the sum of the long and the short range gives, gives you back the real potential. So that's certainly allowed. And then the idea is we, we calculate these two contributions separately. Calculate first the long range potential. Well, that's simple. That is done simply with the ordinary particle mesh method. And for that to work, we would like to make this splitting scale so that we introduced a scale RS where we split the force in a long and a short range force. And this split scale RS should be of order the mesh cell size slightly larger than we get even rid of the uh, grid anisotropies in the force. Then it's nicely resolved, the scale with the mesh. And then we really have an isotropic, basically a spherical cut in the uh, force or a spherical force split. So we have this long range potential and all we need to do is use the usual PM method, but basically multiply our potential not only with the Green's function, but also with the damping factor for your transform back. And then we get only a long range force, right? This is basically just smoothed out here a bit. For the short range force, that's now uh, on, the, on the grid scales and, and shorter, shorter on scales smaller than RS. There we, we go back to real space and we solve that potential in real space with a tree. And if you full transform this potential back, you can show that what you get is phi of r, the Newtonian potential minus gm over r times this sort of complementary error function um, with an argument r over 2rs. And this complementary error function is uh, uh, you know, something very nice. Basically, this is basically unity uh, when r is smaller than rs and then at rs it drops like a stone. Right? This is sort of what this does. So it's uh, like a, a finite range Newtonian potential. That's what this is. It has a finite range. And um, that we can solve now with the tree in real space, right? So this is the uh, potential with the complementary error function, Newtonian potential just decorated with this, and this is this factor. So it's unity, and when you hit Rs at one, you 
drop like a stone. And what this means is that you can now again do multiple uh, treatments of this, solve this with a tree code, but you have to, from the very start, you only have to walk the tree basically around your target coordinate in a small region. You go, say, out to 5 RS or so. You get all the force, so 10 to the minus 5, you know, it's a negligible error that you then make. So you basically walk the tree only in sort of this spatial region. And that is what gives you the speed up in 3PM. But because tree codes are actually slow compared to particle mesh, but you can speed them up considerably if you uh, restrict their integration to uh, a certain, certain space like this. So that's, for example, implemented in, in the gadget too. So now, actually, some connecting on to what Scott uh, told us yesterday very, very nicely, time integration. Uh, this is what we do also in these cosmological codes. We use these uh, ideas of Hamiltonian integrations with drift and kick. Um, unfortunately, we suffer from this problem that uh, Scott said, that lots of the good properties of uh, these integrators are gone if we do individual time steps. And unfortunately, we usually have to do that individual time steps. So we um, therefore lose a lot of the uh, advantages of these drift, kick, drift, leapfrog integrators that are in principle symplectic for, for fixed time steps, right? Um, but I wanted to point out here one interesting, two, uh, two points that, that I think are, are quite interesting uh, still. So even if you now do the um, individual time steps, it actually makes a difference whether you use this drift, kick, drift version or whether you use kick, drift, kick. Because normally you determine your time step here at the beginning, usually on information like the acceleration of your last time step. Now if you compare, for example, the performance of such a variable time step leapfrog um, in these two variants, uh, drift, kick, drift, and kick, drift, kick, on a reasonably demanding problem, you know, an eccentric Kepler problem, and you find that uh, you get this usual problem that the, the, the good thing of uh, symplectic integrated, the long-term integration is stable, is lost because of the variable time steps. So we have an energy error that keeps growing with each orbit in one direction, so secular trend. But if you go from dkd with the variable step to kdk, you find that the rate with which the error grows goes down by factor of four at the same computation cost. So that's quite, quite, uh, Interesting, so, and, and actually in gadget one, I was doing this thing, and then eventually I saw, found, ooh, this is much better. And so this is what, what, what was done in the gadget two. So sometimes, you know, and, and again, I think it's, it's in, in hindsight, maybe, you know, at least heuristically, you can understand fairly well why maybe there's a factor four difference in the, in the rate with which the arrow grows. Because if you, it has to do with the asymmetry, of course, in, in forward and backwards integration that you have because you, you determine your time step on past information. And you can see here, for example, it, so these blue uh, boxes are supposed to be um, representing the time steps you're doing. And so in the drift, kick, drift, you calculate the force in the middle of the time step. And that means that when you, when you look at this step in the, in the forward integration, then the time step that you're here actually doing depends on information basically of the last force if you use a time step that's determined from the based on the acceleration in some fashion as is often done. So that is basically goes back to this point. Now if you then integrate forward in time and you, you think about coming back with the same integration scheme, then the problem of the symmetry is because this time step, the size of it now when coming back, you will determine based on the size of this force, which is a different one from this. So there's a sort of a, a symmetry here in the information that you exploit for determining this time step. And that's part of the reason why this is not time reversible and that's why you get this, this growth of the secular arrows. But in the kick, drift, kick, the situation is, is the same principally, but it's slightly better because here you now calculate the force at the beginning or end of time steps, of course, immediately reuse. So the cost is the same, effectively. Not only effective, it's the same. And here, the time step size, you know, see, it's determined by the force directly here at the beginning. And here, um, when you come back, it's determined by this force. And they are spaced apart as well, but the symmetry is just half as large as in the drift, kick, drift. And then I'm sure you can probably formally prove that this uh, explains this factor of four in the rate of error growth. 
So in cosmology, as, as Scott introduced, we, we can do this, and I just want to mention here, here we need to solve the Hamiltonian exactly, and this is possible in cosmology because we integrate the cosmological drift factors and kick factors that you can integrate out exactly. And a further refinement that's also interesting in the 3PM, which we actually use is using these ideas of, of Hamiltonian integration is that we split the potential in two contributions analog with the short range uh, and long range force, right? We had this short range potential, long range potential, so we can write down the Hamiltonian now in this form, kinetic form, term, and two terms in the, in the uh, potential energy. And then you can devise basic uh, symplectic integration schemes that, for example, look like this, that you, that you first treat the, um, um, the long range kick, right, which is, <coughs> 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 which is generated by the long range force. So this is one part of the Hamiltonian and you take this other part in your long range integrator as two pieces. And this integration here is another leapfrog problem which you subcycle with another leapfrog. So you can basically insert into a, a long range leapfrog integrator where this whole square bracket is sort of what usually would be the drift, is now subcycled uh, as an integration of this whole piece here, which is another leapfrog problem where, which is just governed by the short range potential and it has presumably shorter time scales, this problem, because the uh, covers shorter scales and uh, deeper potentials, so you need a, a shorter time step for this and you can pick for that some subdivision by some integer m for this time step. Um, and this um, sort of operator uh, notation might be not so, not so clear, but it, what's going on in practice is, is, is really a very neat and clean integration scheme because what you really do then in, in such a scheme is that you, that you always alterate drifts which just move the particles with constant velocity with kicks where you calculate a force and change the momenta. And if you have this sort of two-level time integration scheme, you apply the short range force forces always uh, on every short time step delta t. And if this m here is four, say, you only every four step you calculate a long range force. That's actually what, what, what uh, for example, um, the gadget code does to in the 3PM mode. So, um, so this was uh, what I wanted to say about uh, force calculations based in the collisionless uh, regime except for one thing, and that's also very important uh, in practice, that's namely the issue of, of uh, parallelization and how you exploit now parallel computers for uh, doing this tightly coupled problem. And that's uh, something that's uh, ongoing research and uh, again, I can only encourage you to think about some smarter ways of doing it because the, the, the schemes that are on the market, they, they are all, um, have still very serious limitations and are, are seriously limited in, in, in the scalability. And so um, even though we use these days thousands of CPUs or, or more, um, usually we do this with, with substantial losses and um, you would like to, to make further headway there. So we, are op we need more new ideas. Before I, before I show you some, some approaches that I'm using myself, just want to show you what the 3PM scheme does in, 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 in a real practical applications. And here it turns out that uh, these cos big cosmological simulations, they're actually memory bounded to a large extent. So you can do with these cross calculation schemes, they are sufficiently fast that you can actually do rather large calculations uh, because you also don't need that much memory. So typically, say for storing the phase space variables and, and auxiliary information that you need of the order of say 40 to 50 particles, the tree you can get away with about 40 bytes per particle. Um, the Fourier methods require, say, of order 24 bytes per mesh cell, but that's not needed at the same time as the tree, so you can use this memory for both. So you end up with memory demands of, of the order of 100, part, 100 bytes per particle. And you can do a bit better, certainly, but it's getting, it's probably almost impossible to do much better in effect of two than this. So this is sort of the order of magnitude you, 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 you have. And for example, in this uh, uh, largest simulation that uh, we've 
done in 2005, the, this Millennium on 10 to 10 power, because there we needed with this about 840 gigabyte. But people now are, and also we will do soon much larger simulations still, say 200 billion products or so. And there, um, again, we basically limited here by two things. One, the total memory of the biggest big iron that we can get access to, and that's maybe 20, 40 terabyte or so of RAM. Then you can cram in particles in there and you end up with a few hundred billion that you can do in principle. But the challenge, of course, is what the heck do we do with all this data that we produce? And that's actually uh, a serious, serious issue of pain. And I think all of you will suffer even much more than I ever suffered from this in the future because the disk space and uh, the computing centers, by my experience, they don't care all that much about long-term storage of a disk space, post-processing and so on. So you will all get into serious trouble with this. I predict that unless we, we work on that this is improving. So it's not only the cycles, it's also uh, the data volume that's limitation, limiting us and the, the memory per core is actually not going up, uh, in the, has not gone up in the last five to 10 years. Um, and, and I don't see that this is uh, changing. So we will be memory bounded probably in these cosmology and body simulations for a long time. Of course, things change if you add gas, which I'll get to. This is much more <coughs> computation expensive and that way you can, you can burn a lot of cycles um, with, with gas dynamics much more easily. Um, and that's where much of the interest, of course, lies. So that's, uh, in that sense, we are, we are uh, maybe this is uh, a red herring, this, this problem of, of memory limitation. So how do we parallelize? Well, we, we need to, especially if we want to exploit the available, available memory on a parallel computer, we can't afford to duplicate data, right? You should always, if you start out with a new algorithm and you think about it and you think, oh, I duplicate this data, this is a bad idea. Try from the very start, if you, you know, before investing a, light, a lot of time, try to avoid duplicating data because that will, uh, will Become a, will become a headache later on because it will limit your scalability to large problem sizes. You need to be able to use the aggregated memory of the machine, so that basically means we need to do a spatial domain decomposition where we subdivide our particles and assign them to different computers, each of them having their own memory. So one cute way to do this um, is to exploit so-called space-filling curves these are, uh, there are different versions of it. The nicest one of these space filling curves is, uh, it's called the Hilbert curve, <coughs> or piano Hilbert curve. And that um, is a fractal actually. So if it's, it's in two dimensions, it looks like this. You have a, a, a square with maybe four cells and this little U, uh, upside down U or N, is connecting the four cells here in this, in this square. And then you go to a one final level. The idea is what you can't see. Imagine that there's a fine grid of um, four squared cells here. And then we take this fundamental shape here, turn it, place it here, turn it here again, place it here again, turn it here, connect it, and then you have a curve that's uh, visiting each of these 16 little cells once. Right? And in that sense, it's space filling on a discretized space. Um, and then you keep going recursively like this, right? You, you subdivide this again, and then you take your pattern that you had and put it here again in a suitable turned in reflected fashions. And you see how this goes. You can devise a scheme where this is just done uh, indefinitely on ever finer grids. And this curve that you generate here is self-similar Right? You, you see the same pattern here appearing everywhere again. That's why it's a fractal. And it has another important property that um, points that are close on this line. So you have basically a mapping here of a two-dimensional space to a one-dimensional line along this curve. That two points that are close on the curve are also close in real configuration space. And uh, that has several uh, interesting things that you, uh, several, this property you can exploit in many different ways. One is that if you uh, imagine that you take your particles in your n-body code and you, you sort them in memory along such a curve, 
And then you have, of course, loops that go over the particles. Then the next particle in a loop will be one that's spatially close. That will always be basically the case, or most of the time. Because that's then the case, this new particle that's spatially close will have essentially the same interaction list with the three nodes as you had before. And if you're lucky, the data that you then need is already uh, has been already retrieved from main memory and is sitting in some of the cache hierarchies of, of your processor, and that speeds up your calculation a lot. And the other aspect is that you can use this to do a domain decomposition. So you take this uh, one-dimensional curve and you take scissors and cut it at various points, for example, at four points. And then each of these cuts um, generates a domain for you, right? Because you get then pieces of this one-dimensional line, and since it's space filling, certain space corresponds to it. Here, for these cuts, I get four pieces. And these are now domains, uh, which I can map to certain processor. And what you see is, OK, they, they don't have necessarily boxy or rectangular shapes. But they, are, um, they have usually a, a relatively, still relatively small surface to volume ratio because of this property of the fractal that it wraps around locally before it wanders off to another space. So you get this sort of simply connected regions. That's good um, for parallelization purposes. And the other nice aspect of this is that this kind of uh, subdivision is, is, in a sense, commensurable with the Barnes and Hutt oak tree, right? Because I remember the Barnes and Hutt oak tree was also uh, a set of cubes, and basically each I can now imagine a scheme where each of these domains grabs just exactly one piece, one a couple of branches of the global fiducial oak tree, and I don't have to uh, destroy the tree structure in any way to get this. You can also do this in three dimensions. This is the Piano-Hilbert curve in 3D. That is then actually used in, in, in uh, our codes. And sort of this idea of uh, space filling curves is now used in, in a number of codes. I think also Flash, for example, uses this. And as I said, um, in the tree code, very nicely, you have that uh, this uh, division is commensurable with the tree structure. This means if you imagine a fiducial Barnes and Hart oak tree, then any of these cuts that I do on this Piano-Hilbert curve tells me accurately which of these branches I should put on a certain processor. And that uh, means, in, in a way, that uh, the multipole expansion does not depend on the domain decomposition. Right? So the, the uh, grouping is not affected by it, because I always um, you know, split the domains at the box boundaries of the tree. And um, that's also advantages uh, in, for various reasons. So, um, actually, I think I'm out of time now. So, I, I, I think I'll discuss these further intricacies of parallelization in my next lecture and then um, move on to, to SPH then. Thanks. <laughs>